Peter Sturzberg was born in China in 1913. His mother was half Japanese and half Irish. And his father was a member of the colonial administration, the British colonial administration in China. So he grew up in a curious kind of imperial household of mixed race and ultimately ended up in Canada when he was in his very early 20s and started his career as a journalist. He had become one of the very first people working for the CBC News. This is around 1938, and the CBC had just set up a news department. And of course, like he would have been at the time in 1938, 25 years old, say. So like everybody, every journalist uh, of the period, when the war broke out, the number one thing they wanted to do was they wanted to go to cover the war. So finally in 1942, they agreed to send him, and in early 1943, he arrived in London. He covered them first of all in the invasion of Sicily, and then as they, as they progressed up Italy and across the so-called Hitler line, uh, so he followed the Canadian troops all through Italy. Then he followed the Canadian troops for the liberation of Holland, and then he ended up in Berlin just uh, shortly after VE Day. And through the course of it all, of course, what he was doing was he was reporting on how the war was going from the point of view of Canada. And so it was the first time that people could actually hear what war sounded like. There's a famous piece of my father broadcasting from the Leary line in Italy, where you can hear him say, listen to the guns roar. Just listen to those guns roar. And then you hear the guns in the background. So it was actually allowed, and the Canadians were the only ones who had this technology, it actually allowed the Canadians to bring people into the sound of the war in a way that had never happened before. We're in the attic of an old Italian farmhouse that overlooks the front as it's on a slight bridge. I'm standing here looking out of a hole in the wall that was made by a shell uh, during, the, the, during the fighting here two days ago. This house, though, hasn't really been very badly damaged. It's uh, the only one who's standing that I've seen for miles around. Peter Sturzberg landing in Sicily was the first time a Canadian broadcaster had covered uh, Canadian troops on the move. He arrived just in time uh, to cover the liberation of one of the, the key uh, objectives of the Canadian force that landed in Sicily, uh, the town of Ajira, uh, which was uh, liberated in uh, late July uh, 1943. And so he came basically the evening of the battle and was able to uh, uh, get there when the town square had been uh, liberated and the Seaforth Highlanders of Canada pipe band was playing the church bells in the background and was able to broadcast uh, from the, for the first time uh, Canadians liberating a uh, European, uh, European city. Uh, after years of really bad news uh, in, in the, the wartime news coming from the CBC and elsewhere, uh, this was uh, quite, a, quite an event. During the Second World War, radio was the only electronic media. There was uh, print reporting, uh, there was certainly a newsreel and film that had been around for some time, and uh, photogra photographic reporting was certainly available. But radio was um, in, at the cutting edge of technology. It was a way to bring, uh, with only a few hours delay in some cases, or at the least a, a day or more, uh, a delay reporting of uh, real live sounds from the battlefield into people's living rooms in a way that had never uh, been the case before. This was done through uh, very bulky, uh, by today's standards, portable uh, recording units uh, that weighed, uh, you know, uh, uh, dozens of pounds each that were carted on a Jeep that could then be brought to a mobile recording van and all of this sort of thing. But the result was that broadcasters uh, like Sturzberg were able to lay live commentary over uh, events as they happened. It's a great honor for the School of Journalism and Communication to host the annual Peter Sturzberg Foreign Correspondence Lecture. We're in the business here of training young journalists, and down the road, some of them will likely end up reporting from conflict zones. The Sturzberg Lecture Series is one way of ensuring that when they do, the journalism they produce will be smart and meaningful. Hearing from the best of today's foreign correspondents can't help but inspire journalists of the future to do their best, and hopefully their journalism will also contribute to more informed decision-making around the world.
Welcome to the seventh annual Peter Sturzberg Foreign Correspondence Lecture, hosted by Carleton University's School of Journalism and Communication, in partnership with the Canadian War Museum and CBC Ideas. My name is Alan Thompson. I'm the director of Carleton's School of Journalism and Communication. The Sturzberg is one of our major keynote events, named for legendary war correspondent Peter Sturzberg, and meant to examine the nexus between journalism and conflict. We had hoped to gather together in person at the Canadian War Museum for this event. Unfortunately, our guest speaker this year, Ukrainian journalist Veronika Makozarova, has been unable to obtain a visitor visa from Canadian authorities. So we decided to proceed online with a virtual event, a format that we did become accustomed to during the pandemic. My thanks then, most of all, to this year's Sturzberg lecturer, Veronika Melkozarova, the Politico Europe correspondent in Ukraine. Our moderator for this evening, the CBC's Nala Ayad, will provide Veronika with a more fulsome introduction in just a few minutes. But I would like to note one thing. By happenstance, Veronika is joining us from her home in Kyiv, rather than being here in person. While I would very much rather have her with us here, there is something to be said for having a lecture that focuses on journalism and conflict delivered by a journalist who is right now, at this very moment, in a war zone. Some of the war correspondents of Peter Sturzberg's era complained either privately or in the post-war <laughs> years about how conflicted they felt about their coverage. They were literally considered to be part of the team, serving in uniform as officers of the Canadian Armed Forces, subject to a regime of censorship or self-censorship. I know Veronica will speak about that sense of conflict in her role and the pressure to support your own country at war, something that connects her to Peter Sturzberg. The Canadian War Museum has, from the very beginning, been an invaluable partner for this annual event, recognizing how one of Canada's most remarkable war correspondents used the medium of radio to help Canadians to understand what it meant for their country to be at war. At this time, I would like to invite Michael Petru of the Canadian War Museum to say a few words of welcome. Michael? Thank you, Alan, and thank you all for being with us today. The Canadian War Museum is honored to once again be collaborating with Carleton School of Journalism and Communication on this prestigious and important event. I'd like to acknowledge and thank too Richard Sturzberg, son of Peter Sturzberg, for his role in establishing this lecture series in the memory of his father. And we're lucky to be joined today by CBC radio host Nala Ayed, one of the finest journalists and foreign correspondents of our generation, who will be our moderator. The Canadian War Museum is grateful to Nala and the CBC for their long support of the Peter Sturzberg Foreign Correspondence Lecture. And most importantly, a warm welcome to this year's lecturer, Veronica Malkazarova, the Ukraine reporter for Political Europe. Veronica, I believe I can say with certainty, as someone who's familiar with both your journalism and Peter Sturzberg's, that he would be proud to have his legacy linked to yours. In 1920, excuse me, in 2020, before Russia escalated its ongoing war against Ukraine to a full-scale invasion, Veronica wrote an article that explored the costs in recent decades of doing journalism in Ukraine. Those costs are startling. 50 Ukrainian journalists had died between 1991 and 2020 simply for doing their jobs. As Veronica wrote at the time, they quote, paid dearly for their newly obtained freedom of speech. That number, those costs, have sadly gone up since February 2020. And any consideration of that toll inevitably leads to an equally stark question. Why pursue journalism in the face of such danger? What justifies the risk? what justifies the grim and inevitable whole. It's a question with which journalists have struggled for as long as they've done this work. 
as indeed I did during my own many years as a foreign correspondent. Looking back on her own life and career, Martha Gellhorn, who covered some of the bloodiest conflicts of the 20th century, reflected on her own lost idealism. When I was young, she wrote, I believed in the perfectibility of man and in progress and thought of journalism as a guiding light. But as more wars erupted, as the civilian toll exponentially increased, Galhorn's faith in what her journalism might accomplish faltered to the point that she concluded, I quote her again, for all the good our articles did, they might have been written in invisible ink, printed on leaves, and loosed to the wind. Imagine this inner struggle about the purpose of your life's work. Then imagine that, like Veronica Makozarova, the war you're covering is your own country. The people whose fear, anxiety, and pain you chronicle are your neighbors, your friends, your family. And yet, Gellhorn persisted in her work. Veronica persists in hers. Journalists across Ukraine and around the world do the same. So again, why? Vasily Grossman, the great Soviet, the great Ukrainian journalist, was with the Red Army in the summer of 1944 when it reached the site of the Treblinka death camp in what had been Poland. Nazis had tried to destroy evidence of their murder of some 800,000 Jews, but Grossman walked the grounds and held in his hands his crushed bone, hair, and ash, he spoke with survivors and guards. He reported in searing detail what he learned. Then, in his report, he wrote the following. It is infinitely hard even to read this, he said. The reader must believe me, it is as hard to write it. Someone might ask, why write about this? Why remember all that? He, can, he answered his question. It is the writer's duty to tell this terrible truth. And it is the civilian duty of the reader to learn it. But why? To what end? It's been 80 years since the Treblinka death camp shut down. Every day there are a few survivors of the Holocaust, leaving those, as, those of us who are left severed from their living memories. And as their voices fade and grow silent, other voices grow louder. It didn't happen, they say. Grossman's report is a rebuke. Yes, it did. I was there. I spoke to those people. I saw those things. Why write about this? Why remember all that? On February 27th, 2022, Russian soldiers invaded the Ukrainian city of Bucha, northwest of Kiev. And they were forced out a month later. Evidence emerged of war crimes that included the murder of hundreds of civilians, torture, and rape. The Kremlin denied it. The evidence was fake, they said. Ukrainians committed the murder themselves. But journalists, including Veronica, went to Bucha. It did happen, they told the world. We were there. We spoke to those people. We saw those things. Why write about this? Why remember all that? Bucha provides us with one answer. Journalism is a barrier against forgetting, disinformation, and denial. It is also an act of resistance and defiance. As a Czech novelist Milan Kandara wrote, the struggle of man against power is a struggle of memory against forgetting. But I think the service that journalists such as Veronica provide provides goes deeper still. Journalists are by nature optimists. Despite everything, they, we, believe in what Galhorn called the perfectibility of man, or at least our capacity for improvement. They believe, as Martin Luther King said, that the arc of the moral mark, excuse me, they believe, as Martin Luther King said, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Maybe. Maybe 
because if you report on strife and human suffering for long enough, you study history for long enough, you learn something about time and the arc of the moral universe, and that is that time is neutral. Time is neutral. It will do nothing but kill us. The moral universe bends in any direction, away from justice or towards justice. It bends that way because of what we do, the decisions we make, the actions we take. We take those actions, we make those decisions because we're informed. That's the job that Veronica does. That's the calling she answers. That's the mission she fulfills. That's why we write about this. That's why we remember all that. I can think of a few things that are more noble or more necessary. And Veronica, I can think of a few greater privileges than hearing from you today. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And it's wonderful to have the Canadian War Museum as a partner in this event. Uh, I look forward to being back in person uh, later this year. As I mentioned, because we're joining virtually, I'm actually in my office on the campus of Carleton University. And I would like to acknowledge that Carleton is located on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. I encourage you, wherever you are, uh, to think about the land on which you live and, and work. Uh, Peter Sturzberg was among the first to cover Canada's troops in the field during the Second World War. He used the latest technology of the day to infuse his reports with the sounds of the battlefield. And Peter Sturzberg was the last living Canadian correspondent from the Second World War when he passed away at the age of 101 in 2014. His children, Judith Lowry and Richard Sturzberg, created two initiatives with Carleton's Journalism School to honour their father. The first is the Peter Sturzberg Award in Conflict Journalism and Media Studies. The award was intended to help a student in Carleton's Master of Journalism program complete a thesis or journalism project. This year, Afghan journalist <clears throat> Farida Nekzad will use the award to support her research on the restrictions faced by journalists in Afghanistan, particularly women. The second initiative created by the Sturzberg family is an endowment in support of today's event the annual Peter Sturzberg Foreign Correspondence Lecture. Over the years, we've heard from some incredible correspondents, Lise Doucette, Janine De Giovanni, Adrian Arsenault, Larry Madowo, and Nima Elgahar, and last year from Giancarlo Fiorella, Senior Investigator for Bellingcat. Because this lecture celebrates the legacy of Peter Sturzberg's work as a war correspondent, I'd like to invite Richard Sturzberg, Peter's son, to join us now on behalf of the Sturzberg family to say a few words. Richard. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, let me just begin by thanking um, Veronica for putting up with all the back and forth in terms of getting this organized. Um, I'm glad that you're able to be with us virtually and sorry that you're not able to be with us in person. I was looking forward to meeting you. Um, I'm struck by the how the current situation for journalists covering wars is so different from what it was during my father's day. As Alan mentioned earlier on, during the Second World War, Canadian journalists wore Canadian Army uniforms and enjoyed honorary ranks as captains. They were, of course, expected to report accurately on what was going on but the uniforms made clear what side they were on and how they were expected to conduct themselves. My sense is that the role and moral choices now for journalists covering wars in their own countries where they want, and in the case of Ukraine where they must win, are much more complicated. I look forward, Veronica, very much to hearing your talk. And let me just say finally, on behalf of the Sturzberg family, I'd like to add my thanks to Alan, the Carleton Journalism Department, NALA and the CBC Ideas crew, and the Canadian War Museum for all the hard work that they put in over the course of the last seven years to make what I think is now an absolutely excellent series. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Richard, uh, for your role here tonight. And through you, uh, let me thank your family for your generous support of the Sturzberg Award and lecture. At its core, this event is about journalism, good journalism, the kind of reporting that helps us to understand our world, particularly during times of conflict. How fitting that the moderator of tonight's, sorry, this afternoon's event is one of Canada's best known foreign correspondents and public intellectuals, the CBC's Nala Ayed. Nala was born in Winnipeg to Palestinian parents. She spent part of her childhood in the Middle East. We got to know each other on Parliament Hill when as young reporters, I was with the Toronto Star and Nala with the Canadian Press. I'm also proud to say she is a graduate of Carleton's Master of Journalism program. In 2002, Nala joined the CBC and reported from Amman, Baghdad, Beirut, and across the region, and later spent close to a decade covering world events from London. In 2012, she published her award-winning memoir, A Thousand Farewells. She's now the host of CBC Radio's nightly program, Ideas, which is a partner in this event and hopes to rebroadcast part of the lecture. Nala, we are so lucky to have you join us this evening. Nala will formally introduce our guest speaker, engage her in a conversation following the presentation, and then take your questions. And a reminder to our audience on Zoom, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to pose a question. And with that, I would like to turn the rest of this event over to our moderator, Nala Ayed. Nala. Thank you uh, very much, Alan, for your kind introduction. And thanks to all of you um, for including us in this event yet again this year. It's an honor to be back for another annual Peter Sturzberg Foreign Correspondence Lecture. Of course, it's a very important lecture on the CBC Ideas calendar, and it will be aired, as Alan mentioned, on our program, both uh, on broadcast, 8 p.m. weekdays, uh, but also on podcast. So it'll be available everywhere um, once we set the date, which uh, we will be announcing in the coming weeks. But it's also a lecture that is close to my own heart, especially this edition of it, having been a foreign correspondent myself and having also worked in Ukraine. But today is about Veronica Melkozerova. Uh, Veronica is, as mentioned, a Kyiv-based journalist who has been covering Ukraine for foreign audiences since 2014, when Euromaidan protests ousted pro-Russian President Viktor Yanukovych. When in 2022, Russian forces started their full-scale invasion of her country, Veronica stayed in Kyiv throughout the siege of the capital, reporting for many Western media, including The Atlantic, NBC News, and Times Radio London, among many others. Also, she worked for several years at the Kyiv Post and the New Voice of Ukraine. Since 2022, She's written eloquently and sensitively about the impact of the war, about the decolonization of Ukraine, about the waxing and waning Western support for Ukraine's war effort, and about the price of corruption at home, mostly, as I'll mention, for political Europe, as well as in a blog that was read by nearly a quarter of a million people on Twitter or X. Veronica's work has also been recognized abroad and at home, in 2021, she won the top Ukrainian journalism competition for best breaking news. Uh, Veronica also attained a master's degree in Kyiv in drama and theater arts, and she was also a graduate of a Journalism for Future Challenges program at the Stockholm School of Economics in Riga. Veronica was born in Kyiv a few months before Ukraine gained independence in 1991, and that is where she will be delivering her lecture from. Please welcome Veronica Melkozerova. Thank you very much for having me. Um, it's a great honor. Uh, I hope you will introduce me so well that I won't disappoint the audience. Um, actually, I'm not a war reporter and I never wanted to be one. But uh, when war comes into your country, you kind of have no choice. Uh, and Russia's war against Ukraine actually started in 2014, not in 2022. At first was a new type of invasion, a hybrid invasion, because as soon as uh, our Euromaidan protest ousted pro-Russian President Viktor Yanukovych, Russia annexed Crimean Peninsula, a Ukrainian sovereign territory, 
and fueled uh, pro-Russian uprisings in Ukraine's region of Donbass, which basically takes Ukraine's east and Ukraine's south. So Russia responded in a colonial power kind of way, if we want to be independent really from Russia, we must lose the territory, we must pay for daring. Um, their tactics of the hybrid warfare against us was deny and it didn't happen. It meant more than actual effects actually. And this approach worked well, not only for Russia, but for the rest of the world, unfortunately. Everyone kept doing business with Russia as usual, including Ukraine. The Kremlin got no serious punishment for redrawing borders of Europe by force. So in 2022, it returned for more. My career in journalism started right after Russia invaded my country for the first time. But back then, only the Ukrainian media called this an invasion, while the rest of the world preferred other kind of description of what was going on. Even though Igor Stelkov and many other top so-called separatists had Russian citizenship and even worked for Russian security services. And the regular Russian army blocked Ukrainian forces in the military bases in Crimea. I changed uh, newsrooms and soon started working as a freelance producer and writer with many top US media outlets. And I tried to describe things the way they were. So I called separatists Russian backed militants to clarify their Ukrainian and Russian origin and the fact that they were getting money from the Kremlin to fight against internationally recognized Ukrainian government. However, I was heavily ed edited. I was heavily edited. Russia does not admit it supports them, so we can't call them Russian, one of my editors told me back then. Uh, editors also had the ongoing discussion on how to describe what was going on in Ukraine. Was it a civil war, a conflict, or a hybrid invasion? And they usually chose the vaguest definition of them all. Conflict in Ukraine, or Ukraine crisis. As if it was some kind of an internal argument or a civil conflict, and not the ongoing... In, 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 as if it uh, was some kind of internal argument or a civil conflict and not the ongoing international war where the official Ukrainian government was trying to counter Russian sponsored and Russian directed militant groups, which were trying to take control over certain part of the country to then attach it to Russia, which is exactly what they did in 2022. Before the full scale invasion, nothing was certain and everything was possible just like Russia always wants it to be. Ironically, this approach allowed the Kremlin to justify its invasion of Ukraine in 2022. The Kremlin uh, used its special coverage of Ukrainian Nazi problem, together with the vague definition of war published by many Western media back then, to claim that we were a failed state that must be denazified. As a former freelance writer, I can tell you that there was a time between 2019 and 2021 when the only story you could actually sell from Ukraine was either about corruption or about Azov, a Ukrainian volunteer battalion formed from mostly Russian-speaking football hooligans and far-right nationalists in 2014 in response to the first Russian aggression. Azov was later taken under our government's control, it was in 2015, and incorporated in, as a part of Ukrainian National Guard, reformed. But of course, back then, the details of why they appeared in the first place and what were they fighting against 
uh, were not that interesting. Ukraine was labeled a low interest country and our war was at some point labeled a forgotten war. So all people knew about Ukraine before 2022 was corruption and Azov, usually written by foreign reporters, parachuting into the country for a week to write about Ukraine's far-right problem through the lens of America or Europe. So all most of people knew about my country was that we're sort of the same as Russia, but not as cool and mysterious. Though everyone did discover that we elected a comedian as president in 2019. At the same time, Russia was way more active, pushing the corrupt Nazi Ukraine narrative and in constant denial of its military and financial involvement in the war in Ukraine. These were its main tools to prepare for and justify its full-scale invasion. Western media was at that time uninterested in actual Ukraine story, usually covering it from Moscow as a sideline topic. So we Ukrainians were habitually outmaneuvered by Russia. Now let me take you to February 2022. It was the month when the United States and other Western intelligence services were screaming about the upcoming Russian invasion. Airlines, embassies were leaving Ukraine. But our leadership were blaming everyone for being hysterical and denied the prospects that Russia would actually dare to invade us. But then February 24 happened. We woke up at 4 a.m. as Russians were barraging us with missiles, with their troops attacking us from the east, north, and south. Most international teams understandably fled Ukraine, or at least moved to safer places like Lviv, just like thousands of Ukrainians. I remember one news host of a very influential primetime show on an American TV channel reporting from the border with Poland. His colleagues were praising his courage because he was so close to the war zone. Meanwhile, I was taking part in the same TV show via Zoom from Kyiv, where Russian forces were trying to destroy a power plant in my district. And I was like, well, okay. When the Kyiv region was under siege, many foreign media finally started asking us, Ukrainians, to speak about and for ourselves. They were doing it largely because of safety concerns for their own journalists, but that still helped us to tell our own story and to show that Ukraine was actually full of people who did not consider themselves Russian and had rich history and culture of their own as well as national identity Russians aimed to erase. Foreign media used Ukrainian reporters and even started giving us violence in the stories. Previously, Ukrainian journalists were mostly helping Western reporters as producers or fixers. Once in 2019, a Wall Street Journal reporter told me that I should be grateful just for the opportunity to work for such a reputable publication even though they were paying me peanuts. But the full-scale invasion changed the situation drastically. Nobody knew how the events would unfold. Within days, Russians occupied some 20% of our territory. Experts predicted that Kyiv would fall in a week. With some exceptions, international news teams were afraid to report from Kyiv. So it was then when we got our voice in the media. From window in my grandma's apartment on the 14th floor, I watched lines and lines of cars heading west every day as lonely Ukrainian tanks and military trucks were rushing in the opposite direction. However, not everyone fled. Hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians stayed in their hometowns and villages, organizing resistance and joining the army or becoming um, military volunteers delivering essentials to the front. 
President Volodymyr Zelensky also stayed, as well as key main President Volodymyr Zelensky also stayed, as well as key members of the government. Ukraine demonstrated to the whole world that it was ready to fight the unprovoked invasion. As Kyiv was under siege, the city was full of fear, but it was also full of happy moments, unity, an incredible feeling of community. Those who weren't fighting were delivering aid or weapons while others were patrolling or searching for food and supplies on the nearly empty store shelves. There were no vacancies in our territorial defense forces. We helped pregnant women who were giving birth in bomb shelters in Kyiv. And we also reported what was happening to us, speaking to the world daily, tweeting, posting videos. We showed our nation's fight against this violent invasion 24 seven. This invasion whose aim was to erase those of us who refused to turn into Russians. We understood that denazification really was about destroying Ukrainian nation. And the world finally started thing, seeing things the way they were. We seemed perfect back then as a nation, a pure survivor and fighter. Media coverage was largely the same, factual. Now the storyline was, Ukraine was attacked. It defends itself against bigger, stronger aggressor who came to rob, kill, and rape. So we must help Ukraine. It now seemed that all the narratives about Ukraine's corruption and its ultra-nationalist groups were forgotten and even ceased to exist for a while. Meanwhile, Russian propaganda was still very much alive, focusing on all the negativity, past feuds, and conflicts it could find to undermine Western support for Ukraine. However, people's compassion towards the actual victim proved stronger. Even Poland forgot past feuds and turned into one of Ukraine's strongest allies back then. Kyiv seemed to have won the propaganda war in 2022. Our media coverage also helped to make that happen. Ukrainian and Western journalists in the first months focused more on covering Russian bombings um, war crimes and Ukraine's struggle to take back the occupied territories and save its people. And in fact, that is still what's going on today. Yes, Ukrainian journalists may seem flexibly biased. However, while our Western colleagues position themselves above the story with their balanced, third, both sides say coverage, we were inside the story, much more into the context of things. So besides providing information on who said what, we also explained what that actually meant. And that helped many people to understand that Russia's invasion of Ukraine was based on lies and imperialist ambitions. Soon more and more newsrooms around the world were also dropping their obscure and timid language in their war coverage and were no longer afraid to call black black and white white. However, the longer the war continued, the harder it became to keep supporting Ukraine. Compassion means aid, and aid means incredible financial burden. And yes, morality dictates it's still the right things to do. But one's own problems are always closer to home. So to keep supporting the victim in these circumstances, the victim must remain perfect. And that's, of course, impossible. In the Russian media, we're trying their best to show how far Ukraine was from being a perfect victim. Flooding mainstream media and social media with fake stories, orchestrated videos, disinformation, and whataboutism. Nowadays, a fake post is all it takes because of news saturation. People are more likely to fall for fake news and probably won't even care to read a debunking article. But we as reporters are faced with another kind of dilemma, undermining our own country at war. 
by which I mean reporting on our own corrupt officials. Let me give you an example. As soon as Russians were forced to withdraw from Kyiv, some of Ukraine's officials reverted back to business as usual, stealing on state procurements at times when Ukraine was begging for foreign financial and military support. What do you do when vital support depends on you being worth it? And every critical story exposing defense sector corruption or backtracking of anti-corruption reform or rising influence and control of president's office on every process of the state during war will be used by your attacker to cement the message. See, Ukraine is a failed state. It is not democratic. Therefore, it's not worthy. Every flaw, every negative story would be amplified and used to undermine Ukraine, which had already been weakened by war. So, should I write that critical article now? Is this even the right time to write something like that? These were the questions and still are the questions most Ukrainian and I think foreign journalists keep asking themselves over the past few over the past two years. And it seems that Ukraine's dependence on Western aid has a lot of conditions. Ukraine must be flawless. Ukraine must reform itself during wartime. And now we are told that we should still conduct elections even when Russians are attacking crowded areas all over the country. During martial law, the government has every right to postpone elections and control in information that is coming out of Ukraine. And every government, including the Ukrainian one, uses those powers. We now have all the biggest and most popular TV channels united into one teleton, pushing one common narrative 24 seven. Is it normal? During times of war, unfortunately it is. However, besides fighting for existence, we're also a democracy. So we have to stay democratic and democracy means power of the people to control and criticize their government and in institutions, even when at war. But the scale of Russia's war is so intense that we journalists gave our officials a pass. During first six months, we focused our efforts on reporting numerous Russian war crimes in Ukraine, those committed in Bucha or Kherson or Mariupol. We hoped our officials would focus on protecting our country and that included protecting us from corruption that might undermine our chances to win the war against Russia. However, this is not what we got from our government. Instead, corruption continued, followed by gaslighting, unjustified denials of access, and getting ghosted for reporting about it. As soon as we saw that a lack of reporting gives the green light to steal from a nation at war, while everyone else is distracted by Russia's atrocities, we understood that we need to act. In the long run, the ongoing corruption was and still is weakening Ukraine. Indeed, Ukraine's enemies and Russia's friends all around the world used our reporting against our country's public image. At the time, we finally saw positive, at the, at the same time, we finally saw positive changes at home. The defense minister was ousted, the corruption fight renewed, and several high-profile corrupt officials and oligarchs came under increased, under increased scrutiny. The bureaucracy that slowed down supplying the war front was simplified. However, many foreign officials, including those in the US Republican Party or Slovakian Prime Minister started using our reporting to show why it was necessary to stop sending money to us. We got our corrupt Ukraine image back at exactly the time we were, when we needed crucial support more than ever. It was as if we were just getting aid for no reason, not for fighting the genocidal invasion on, on our own. I'm shocked how easy it is for Russia to normalize itself-styled 
right to barrage Ukraine cities and towns with missiles. Everyone forgets so quickly. In 2023, nobody already talks about Ukraine's gigantic successes, as well as why Ukraine refused to negotiate with Russia. Think of Bucha, the killing, raping, and mutilating of civilians, the annexation of the occupied territories, and the bombing of ports. In May 2023, we in Kyiv slept for just a week as Russia was shelling the capital with cruise missiles, even used the Kinjal hypersonic missile, which was created to destroy aircraft carriers in the sea. We survived a winter of blackouts. We endured 20% of our economy getting destroyed. And yet, we managed to keep our institutions running, as well as even raise money for our own state budget. But we don't hear about that. What we do hear are stories that our counteroffensive brings no results, even with all the Western weapons we've got. Russia is too strong, the story goes. However, the reports about Russia also getting military aid, getting more and more help from the global south, in China are not as popular, not to mention reports of numerous European-based companies still selling and reselling Western parts to Russia's military, as well as buying Russian natural resources, and by doing all that, financing Russia's war against us. Yet I have no regrets. We remain committed to practicing fair and professional journalism and covering corruption on our own side during wartime. Even though Volodymyr Zelensky reportedly even asked some journalists not to do it until the end of war. But Ukrainian journalists responded that if they were to do that, the war might never end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Veronica. If we were all with you, we would be applauding warmly mm -hmm. um, for such a revealing and thoughtful presentation. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And imagine lots of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Um, before we start with the formal discussion, Veronica, I, I'd just like to ask you something. It's now just shy of the start of the third year of hostilities in Ukraine. Um, but of course, as you mentioned, this has all been going on for a decade since 2014 for you. How are you holding up? <laughs> Honestly, we sometimes don't know how we do that. I think that uh, you never know what your uh, body and your mind is capable of. Uh, I think it's just that, of course, it's easier for me because I don't have children uh, to stay in Ukraine and to report from Ukraine. But also the factor that I really don't want this country, my home country, to cease to exist. Uh, I think it's what keeps me and many other Ukrainians here, still fighting, still doing their jobs. Because uh, while about 700,000 Ukrainians keep fighting at the war front, um, most of us stayed in the country and we have to pay taxes, we have to keep our economy running to be able to afford to fight because Ukraine is now uh, the country that pays for uh, home production weapons and also pays salaries for soldiers at the war front. I, how do I say this? I, I've been um, out there and I've covered some horrific things, uh, so has Michael, who's on this call, and other foreign correspondents, and as well as journalists who work anywhere. But it's a whole other thing covering these stories in your own country. And um, I, I really just am curious, I, you've explained to us the motivation, of course, but can you speak to your coping? Like, how is it that you help yourself keep going when you are covering such difficult stories right in your own backyard? Uh, I think that, uh, I don't know if you had this uh, rule of two weeks or a month, like you spend a month or two weeks and then you go on the retreat. Um, 
I hadn't had the chance to have this kind of retreat until recently when I visited our office in Brussels. Uh, and I there I understood that um, things have become so bad for me emotionally that here in Ukraine, I felt better than abroad in a peaceful country because uh, there I have to constantly um, speak to people who never experienced in their lifetime what we did. Fortunately, I do not want them to do that, not like any nation. Um, but they, you, I think that they are not like us already because we have our values changed. We have... Uh, our temper has changed. We have become more heated. Uh, we don't want to take any, uh, you know, people. I traveled a lot for work since the invasion started and people reacted on me differently. Um, but there was some common thing. In 2022, everyone was like, oh, Ukraine go for it. We support Ukraine. You will win. Well, this year it was um, like, oh, as if I was terminally ill or so. Uh, so these kind of uh, interactions, they are difficult because, you know, maybe it's like sort of a psychological thing. I don't know. But when you speak to the people who survived or had the, their countries uh, survive the same as your country you kind of bond with them better and with people who like were born in uh, post-war war to Europe where everything was like already there existing it's very hard to find common ground you it struck me that you still despite everything you've been through and all the hard work that you've engaged in, that you say that you have no regrets. I, I wonder if you could provide an example, like what's the most single, the single most powerful experience that you've had as a journalist that underlines the fact that you have no regrets in choosing to do what you do? Um, in uh, Ukraine after 2022, I would say, it was a story that I did for Politico about uh, stolen Ukrainian children. I met a group of children that were just returned with their parents. And the first thing we saw is a woman from Kherson, whose 16 year old daughter was basically taken to a camp in Crimea without any permission of that woman by the occupation authorities when her son was still under Russian occupation. Uh, she just like lost all connection to her daughter, Lisa. And she was trying to find her just then to discover that local authorities, which were basically Russians, uh, decided to send Lisa to Crimea and she will not return. She said she wanted to live in Russia and she, want, uh, she will be soon adopted and given the Russian citizenship. Uh, and the face of that woman who jumped off uh, the, a van, which actually traveled from occupied territories of Kherson through Crimea, through Russian territory, uh, through uh, Estonian border, just, uh, no, through Belarus, just to enter uh, the checkpoint and return to Kherson. So it's basically this kind of a very, very long and hard way. So she she jumped off the van and she was like, I got her, I got my Lisa back. And her face was so like enlightened. And then I saw those kids who were um, so happy to see that everyone's met them with such a like a fuss, they were presented like smartphones, uh, McDonald's, which Ukrainian kids love for some reason, but they do. And when I saw these kind of positive moments after all the tragedies uh, we saw, not only in Bucha and Mariupol and uh, Kharkiv region, all the mass graves, 
in Kherson, Kherson actually is getting the worst of it still because Kherson, with the help of foreign reporters who broke the laws of Ukrainian army and entered the war zone before Volodymyr Zelensky and officials just to show this genuine reaction of Kherson residents, they got a lot of problems afterwards. Some of them even got stripped uh, accreditations because of that. And only after Ukrainian journalist community said, hey, guys, what are you doing? Stop doing that. They got their accreditations returned. But Kherson residents and foreign reporters showed that Kherson was always Ukrainian. They were celebrate, celebrating Ukrainian army. They were kissing the soldiers after Kremlin announced that overwhelming majority of Kherson residents supported joining Russia at the referendum so-called. So Kremlin could not um, forget forget and forgive this. So Kherson is getting hammered and with missiles every day for that. So seeing that kind of happy story just for once was the moment that you asked for. Yeah, that's a really good example. I'm curious, just based on, on the story you just told, how how connected or or cohesive is the is the journalistic core in Ukraine? How connected all of you are, and 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 to what extent do you cooperate and do do those kinds of things together spontaneously? Uh, I think that uh, professional war reporters, uh, I mean those who are traveling like from war to war, uh, Ukrainian ones, they are very connected. They sometimes even hire like one car, or uh, they just join their efforts. Um, when traveling to a certain brigade. Uh, I am mostly connected with the foreign reporters working in Kyiv. Uh, what I forgot to mention uh, is that we finally in 2022 got New York Times, Washington Post, many other, uh, Globe and Mail, by the way, also they have their offices in Kyiv. And it was unimaginable because as I mentioned before the full-scale invasion, it was mostly Russian offices of these very newspapers sending journalists to work in Ukraine as a, some kind of a sideline topic, sometimes interested, sometimes not. But this time, no longer foreign reporters telling, are telling the story through a Russian perspective and from Russia, which basically was a great success, I think. And they are pretty well connected um, in Ukraine right now. Uh, Ukrainian journalists are helping them whenever they got in trouble because uh, Ukrainian government still has a very, I would say, post-Soviet approach to working with the media. Uh, they cannot be as aggressive as the Kremlin or Belarus, for example, jailing people. No, it's not about Ukraine, but you can face difficulties of access, you can face some kind of a strange interrogation. It might happen as well. It, it, like, it, it did happen a couple of times. Uh, and every time like that, Ukrainian journalistic community has to step up and remind Ukraine that we are heading to Europe. We want to be with the part of the Western world and you should not do that. So every time it gets like some such situation happens it has a uh, barbarous trace in that fact and they're being like they have it very difficult every time they try so i think yeah we're we're helping each other now i, I want to go back to the lecture itself um and and the sense that I have is that your talk really is about, of course, this isn't a surprise coming from the show that we work for, is, is that it's really about the idea of journalism, what it's supposed to be and what it's not supposed to be. In your words, if I were to ask you such a broad question, what do you think it is supposed to be in your view? I think it's supposed to be getting into what is happening uh, speaking to people who witnessed with their own eyes and telling how it happened, how the story happened, what went 
wrong and what went right and what it, uh, what this means. And I and by what this means, I don't mean like uh, that I have to, as a Ukrainian journalist, or I would force every journalist in the world to say, hey, Ukraine is a wonderful country. You should never criticize Ukraine because every time you do, you work for the Kremlin. We do have people like this uh, in, in Ukraine, but uh, what I th think is that journalist's job is not only to tell who said what, but also to provide an important context, which sometimes lacks in several, like in reporting. Just today, uh, there was a Reuters, short Reuters story about Putin saying that if Ukraine continues to fight, it risks to lose its sovereignty. And all Reuters did, and basically published Putin's rant, um, I, I never like support this kind of uh, accusations against big Western media corporations of working for Kremlin or spreading Kremlin propaganda. But actually, they just gave a platform for Putin to spread the message and did not provide any context that would say, hey, he says this, but actually, here's what happened. Because, for example, there is like a, th a thesis that uh, by continuing to uh, be resilient and fight against the Kremlin's troops, Ukraine uh, risks to lose it all. Mm -hmm. While you just have to give us what we have now, Russians, I mean, uh, and you might have something left, like your sovereignty, if I let you, this kind of message was it. Uh, if a person does not know the story because people in the world they just like most of them discovered what ukraine was only after 2022 uh if they do not know what was going on and they see uh this story they would think hey putin is give the, giving these guys a chance you stop fighting and everything will be okay everything will end up which is wrong which is manipulation because putin knows exactly that Ukrainian officials asked him not to annex the occupied territories because if if you do, they say, it will close any opportunity to negotiate with us. Kremlin authorities and the Kremlin propagandists never even call Ukraine Ukrainian government. They do not recognize sovereignty of Ukrainian government, calling it Kyiv regime. If you check the coverage, it's all in Kyiv regime, Kyiv regime. How can you negotiate on equal basis with the country that does not recognize your sovereignty? And at the same time, Reuters publishes this kind of story. I think maybe on this example, I I don't didn't do I manage to explain? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Which kind of leads actually to another question. Uh, and, and I I sense that I I think I know what you're gonna say, but you, you've worked for both Ukrainian outlets, but also for, for several foreign ones, as we discussed. And I'm wondering if you think the responsibility of a correspondent changes depending on the audience. Can you talk about that? I think, uh, yes. Uh, I think that, uh, as I mentioned, Ukrainian reporters, they do feel more of this, you know, balancing between uh, patriotism and professionalism. Um, and I would say even that uh, I would prefer Western reporting styles and Ukrainian reporting styles mingle and create something like new because uh, while most of Western uh, foreign reporters who come to Ukraine now, they do their job great. I mean, they come, they speak to people. Many are English uh, speakers right now. And uh, soon, as soon as they got into this environment, I don't know, maybe you felt that or not when you were here, uh, but they kind of feel emotionally attached, it seems, uh, because you cannot feel like 
detached because it's like it's impossible when you talk to people uh on the ground not journalists not politicians but just ordinary witnesses who describe these kind of atrocities that they had to survive you cannot like stay you know above very above the story mm -hmm. but western reporters they face i would say harder challenge because they would still need to get over it and publish the story the way it is, presenting Russia's side of the story, doing everything professionally right. Uh, I'm trying to do that also. Uh, well, Ukrainian reporters, they kind of, I mean, the general ones, not the investigative reporters, uh, but the general mood is that the part, part of Ukrainian uh, journalistic community a little bit forgot uh, how it is to stay balanced because they even started writing, uh, which is pretty annoying for me, is that uh, we have like several prominent news outlets, which are Ukrainian, Ukrainian speaking ones, and they started writing words like Russia, or names of Putin or words like Kremlin from lowercase just to demonstrate how uh, they, you know, they do not respect. <laughs> this kind of stuff is not, uh, it's unacceptable for me as a journalist. I'm, I'm curious for you personally. I mean, you've worn those two hats. You, you talked about what you think the idea of journalism is. Does that vary depending on who you're writing for? Personally, for me, it does not. Uh, but I would say I had uh, experiences with uh, Ukrainian media before uh, 2014. And um, it was not satisfying for me because uh, Ukraine pre-2014 uh, was sort of like a Russian copy in many ways, including the mini media environment, which is basically an oligarch, uh, is buying a news outlet and as soon as uh, he or like bought it uh, he turns it into sort of uh, his own social media you know there's like uh, some of them were allowing a little bit more journalistic freedom but uh, there was still a condition that you have to publish for example our Fifth president Petro Poroshenko had a TV channel. Now he has two, uh, and uh, they have to publish every word that Poroshenko said, every place that he went. So it's like their own PR uh, and political tool. Uh, and I would say that uh, after 2014, our country has started changing drastically because more and more Ukrainian. Uh, they understood that it was wrong to do that. You shouldn't do that. And we got a lot of laws that control the oligarchic influence on the media. However, with the start of the war, uh, government got more powers. In, in every country, it would happen. And uh, uh, we got a little bit backtrack of the, you know, general state propaganda line and many reporters are forced forced to do that they are very tired but government thinks that uh because we are still a democratic country uh we are more vulnerable uh because we have a lot of political forces fighting each other still we do have political opposition and if they would let uh this out of control they think uh, political forces will start infighting and they it will shake uh, the country uh, at war and they don't want to let that happen so where does where does the line um sit for you between patriotism and nationalism like is it a decision you have to kind of make every day when you're covering something or what's the measure for you uh, I was thinking about that a lot in the context of Azov coverage, um, because I did a lot of critical stories about them and many other journalists did. 
because I know that in uh, countries of Western world, for many of the countries of Western world, even uh, the national flag hanging somewhere on the street is something unimagin unimaginably nationalistic. Only America loves to do that. Uh, while here, I would say the situation is um, a little bit special because we got that all on the rise because we are under threat of ceasing to exist. Uh, Ukrainians were, I mean, I was born in Kyiv, which was Russian speaking. I was raised in Russian speaking family of uh, post-Soviet uh, professors. Uh, and uh, all I consumed from like throughout my childhood was Ukrainian language at school, but everything around me, as soon as you enter the cl classroom, you had Russian and you had this portrayal of who am I as a Ukrainian? I am a, I'm not Russian, but I'm a sort of stupid younger Russian brother nation. And all I have, and all I want, uh, I must want to do is to either entertain Russians or marry Russians as a woman or serve Russians. And this is, uh, this was normal for us. We didn't think that, you know, because we, everyone in the world knows Russian culture, Russian ballet, Russian everything. Nobody knows like, Ukrainian culture. Not even we uh, didn't know because it was not popular. It was not fashionable. It was considered uh, just lame. <laughs> From uh, and as soon as uh, Russians, uh, as soon as we started like getting things like back, I mean, we did not uh, this all suppression of Russian speakers and northern nations. I never experienced that as a former Russian speaker. But what I, what I was surprised of is that as soon as many of us started thinking like, hey, we are called Ukrainian for a reason. We're not called Russia, we're called Ukraine. We have a lot of mentioning of Ukraine. We have our own language. Why can't we just like embrace it? We still do have most of Kyiv and most of war front speaking Russian, even soldiers. Uh, but as soon as Putin came to protect me as a Russian speaker, I decided to turn uh, a Ukrainian speaker just because I don't want to be saved by missiles and rockets. You, you wrote very eloquently about that in, in a piece for Politico. I, and and I, I just wonder briefly if you could tell me what it was like to to be going through this with the people you're writing about. I mean, you're talking about from a personal perspective, but you're also covering it, trying to explain this phenomenon of, of what you called the decolonization to your readers. What was that like? It was uh, very interesting because I still have some kind of uh, uh, embarrassment uh, because I stand for Ukraine, because I still, as you asked, very smart question, of where is this line between patriotism and nationalism? Because we all think that nationalism is something very bad uh, and equalize it to Nazi Nazism even. Uh, however, I saw, I see the difference is that well, Russians, for example, they say that they are the best in the world, that they have the right to rule the world, that everyone must obey, and those who will not, they will be crushed. And I think that is ultranationalism and even Nazism. While Ukraine just says, hey, we're not Russia, we are Ukraine, we have our own culture, let us be. Uh, and even the bandera symbol for many Ukrainians, it's very uh, still painful issue because, uh, especially for my region, because we grew up in a Russian-made 
media world. We grew up in Russian controlled archives, uh, in Polish controlled archives, uh, and we never had our chance to speak, to study history, not like created by stronger nations that used to control our land and of course treated air, any kind of resistance as sort of Nazism, nationalism. Um, so Bandana phenomenon uh, became so popular because it was like a boogeyman against Russians. Uh, because most of Ukrainians don't even know his history. Uh, but the fact that Russians are so scared of Bandera, even though he died like dozens of years ago, um, made him like sort of a symbol. And also, uh, I would say that for me as a journalist, it was interesting to hear that other Ukrainians, they have even more deep thoughts and feelings about it because i was always uh, raised to be uh, humble not to be proud of myself not to be proud of my nation because we didn't do anything special unlike russians <laughs> so we're unlike um, uh, americans or unlike everyone who had a very good and uh, pricey propaganda movies, everything that they exported. Uh, for me, I, I, I still sometimes feel guilty. While other Ukrainians, they say, for example, hey, yeah, we do cancel everything Russian right now because of the aggression. Uh, and it's natural response. When somebody sp like speaking Russian, proud of Russian culture comes to kill you, you want to get rid of everything that they worship. Um, but at the same time, parts of Ukrainian society is still resisting. Oh. Sure. Yeah. Uh, saying, uh, I want to just break in just for a second to remind the audience that if you have questions, this is the time to put them in the Q and A function because that is uh, we're going to get to that very shortly. Um, but I do have one more question for you, maybe two uh, quick ones, Veronica, if that's okay. And then before we go to audience questions, but just just picking up on where you were, you're talking about propaganda and and disinformation, and of course you said in your lecture that they they've been a very significant part of of this conflict from the start, uh, and of course playing out online, which is often where these things happen, and, and social media. You recently decided to quit Twitter slash X uh, because of the harassment you endured online. At, at what point did you decide that it just wasn't worth it anymore to stay on, the, on that platform? Um, it was a post uh, that got like more than 25 or 26,000 re retweets and even more thousands of likes. More, honestly, more than any of my story gets. <laughs> um, and it was a post of a certain uh, bot uh which existed only for like a week or so uh and there was a post of pictures of some ukrainians entering a plane and they were wearing good clothes uh and they had like suitcases and this account was like hey ukrainians are not real refugees look at them they have good clothes they have suitcases that i cannot afford why should i uh, give my own money to this nation that has like cars and everything that Ukrainian refugees have. It's a very common trope. And for me, it was like uh, uh, the sign that this uh, platform under mask has become unmanageable. And it, I sort of uh, had a Twitter addiction because of uh, uh, it really helped us a lot, uh, as I mentioned, uh, because many foreign reporters understandably didn't know whether they should come here in the first days and first weeks of war. Uh, they were afraid that they will be like killed or seized. Some of them were killed in Kiev region. So Twitter was kind of a window for us, uh, not only for me, but for many Ukrainian journalists and many ordinary Ukrainians, Ukrainian soldiers, to create this 
horrible reality show of documenting everything we saw and it got traction people saw us uh, because people i think readers still uh, value this uh, personal story personal touch and that's what they respond most to uh, so i i really valued twitter i got addicted and then when Musk bought it uh, and they fired this uh, monitoring, content monitoring team or so, uh, Russians got back and not only Russians, and it was awful. I got messages like, uh, why do you why do you keep fighting for the occupied territories? All the people who uh, were not supporting Russia, they already left. Uh, all who stayed, they just, uh, they want to be in Russia, so surrender. And it was like constantly, constantly. Uh, some of uh, them were, it was like very, very bad harassment, but I was used to it as a journalist. I think many of us are getting it uh, day, daily. However, I understood that it has become sort of like a second job, <laughs> which I'm, I'm not getting paid and I'm making uh, a lot of content for Musk, which is also speaking bad about me. <laughs> yeah. So I decided I should quit because first and foremost, many more professional journalists from abroad than me are already in Ukraine. They already cover our war and they tell about it and they tell about it good. So that's why. I have about 20 more questions I have to ask you, but I am going to turn it now to the audience questions because there's several that have come in, uh, some some really good ones as well. So um, we'll try to get as, through as many of them as we can. Uh, so let, here we go. I will throw a couple at you right away. Some of these are hard. Uh, if Trump wins the next US election, what impacts might you predict for the war in Ukraine if it's still ongoing? <laughs> um, yeah, it's a tough one. Uh, I would say that um, Ukrainians are very scared as well as whole Europe are scared of Trump's victory um, because uh, he said uh, that he would end it very quickly. He knows both Putin and Zelensky. And uh, I would say that um, the way he treated us in 2019, 2020, using Ukraine is his in his uh, uh, attempt to dig dirt in Joe Biden, dragging us into uh, internal politics of the United States, was pretty rough. I was covering uh, Trump impeachment trials and uh, all the Ju Rudy Giuliani's operations in Ukraine. And I would say that tr the main uh, thing why I am scared about uh, Trump's win is that he is very much like he was made on Ukrainian or Russian oligarchs factory. <laughs> he thinks like them. He acts like them and treats power cabinets like them. And unfortunately, we are afraid that Trump might uh, bring uh, the U.S. into isolation, um, which is very bad for Europe, too, because uh, Europe was very reliable, uh, reliant on uh, U.S. Army uh, potential as like the main police force. So they were not investing much into their own uh, capabilities and we're dependent uh, now from Europe more because uh, the United States are still not sending this big aid package. They cannot, they made us again, the tool of the internal politics. Uh, yeah, and I think that it might be bad but as our National Security and Defense Council secretary thinks, uh, Trump is also a politician who very much likes to be loved. And we are still hope, uh, while Americans, they do have the right to like whoever they want, for whatever reason, uh, we still hope that the fact that they support us, the majority of Americans still support us, uh, will mean that he wouldn't dare to throw us under the bus. But 
you never know with Trump. And I think it's the main danger of him. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question uh, about something else that's happened abroad. In 2023, owing to a vast failure of due diligence, Canada's parliament applauded a Ukrainian World War II veteran who had fought for the Nazis. How did or how how are Ukrainians talking about this? And can you speak to any long-term impacts on Canadian Ukrainian relations as a result? Uh, I would say that uh, I spoke about this incident with the former head of our National Remembrance Institute. And uh, he said that basically it was a mistake by Canadian Parliament to bring him. Uh, however, he wouldn't rush uh, to label that man a Nazi because um, there was no like actual, there, there was investigation, as I remember, and it didn't find him guilty of that. Uh, and what was his point also uh, that for whatever reason, everyone, uh, Ukrainian is automatically labeled Nazi, whatever he did or did not do um, if he's connected to the Ukrainian insurgents army. Uh, how, but at the same time, there is like a genocide happening today. There is actual Nazism happening today. And nobody actually is calling out except Ukrainians that it is actually Nazism, modern day Nazism. Uh, so, it's very much, uh, it's good that there was such a debate. I hope it did not affect, and Ukraine was not that uh, long dis uh, of a discussion. Uh, Kremlin liked it, so very much, uh, yeah. And and it was kind of... Um, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I, I'm gonna move on to the next question uh, regarding your reporting and that of others being used by the Kremlin and their supporters against Ukraine. Have you man managed to find ways to safeguard your reporting so that it can't be misrepresented? Uh, I think if, if anyone wants to use your reporting, uh, it's impossible to safeguard them because uh, whatever you do nowadays on the internet, people have opinions and politicians have opinions and uh, you can always like cut a, a certain point that fits your narrative and the message you want to deliver and just send it quoting me, for example. Um, I don't think it's it's possible to do it. You just have to do your job in a professional and fair way and uh, hope that people would read more than just the lead and the yeah. headline, <laughs> that's all. There's, there's, a, there's a degree of helplessness when you put these things online, of course, that, that there is nothing you could do about it. Um, and that's why you're getting a lot of uh, empathy from some of the listeners or, or viewers here. One says, God bless Veronica as a former, oops, sorry, I just missed it here. One second, go back to it. Apologies, technology. She says, or he says, I'm not sure. God bless Veronica as a former citizen of another country under the Soviet influence. This person is from Czech, um, former Czechoslovakia. My heart goes out to you and to your fellow countrymen. Her question is, or his question, what do you do to have some sense, some sense of normalcy or balance in your life? Uh, it's sort of an echo of the first question we asked, but beyond that, what else do you do? Oh, it's actually um, pretty normal stuff. Uh, I'm trying uh, because nowadays you cannot even plan a grocery shopping because uh, after Russians um, attacked uh, a mall in Kremenchuk, it's uh, central Ukraine, with a missile, uh, all the malls were uh, ordered to throw people out as soon as the air raid siren starts. So you can just like walk 15 minutes to get some food and then be thrown out for an hour or two and have to go home again. Uh, so you cannot plan actually anything, um, but still doing some normal stuff, cooking, uh, talking to my um, granny, to my husband, dog. Uh, dog is like uh, answer to all the hard questions and uh, emotions too. Um, 
although he also has anxiety now because of all the shelling, so it's good. Uh, that. Uh, but we do go to the restaurants. Uh, we do uh, go buy books. We have like a book industry boom in Ukraine right now for some reason, because people want to read Ukrainian, many Ukrainian authors getting published. It's like unimaginable. Uh, like even in 2020, I couldn't see that coming. So yeah, we do have this kind of normal stuff. This is a related question, uh, but it's slightly different. How do you protect yourself from the psychological warfare um, waged against journalists by players in the Kremlin and their supporters? Is there a different answer to that? I think since I left Twitter, it has become easier to avoid such interactions. But people find me on Facebook. <laughs> so I would say that uh, I just have to grow thick skin and uh, check the people's accounts uh, for or just uh, to, you know, once in UN, I had an incident with Russia's ambassador to UN, Vasil uh, Nibenza, who was like, throughout the General Assembly, he was saying that Bucha was fake because Ukraine never published the full list of victims. Uh, and we did publish several times. And then I got the, um, uh, the uh, I, I got to ask him a question during the press conference. And Russians in the delegation, because they do have like pretty dodgy people around him all the time. I would not like imagine if there are from FSB or not, but they do look like this kind of types. And they approached me and they said, uh, hello, Veronica, we know you, we know you well, this kind of stuff. And uh, I was like shaking a little bit because I never endured this kind of interaction in Ukraine. It was like pretty intense. And then I still asked him about this question because my colleagues, uh, they just like, allowed me to do it and he was like oh, but, 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 but we didn't saw we didn't see Bucha was fake because there were no corpses when Russians were there and then uh, when they left there were corpses suddenly I was like well logically thank you uh, and then after he ran away from me um, another Russian came and said hey show me please this list we didn't even search for it online <laughs> so this kind of stuff, you just have to stand uh, and you have to be sure that uh, what you do is right and uh, be strong, be not let them intimidate you. That's all. Uh, that's all. That's a, that's a, tall, that's a, a long list. Um... At the height of the invasion, someone asks, the world was glued to their screens, offering support in the forms of activism and aid. After a year, global coverage of the conflict gradually diminished such that today, mainstream coverage of the Ukraine war is far less available. How does it feel that major news organizations around the world have lost momentum in covering the Ukraine war, considering how powerful global journalistic coverage is in both informing, uh, in informing worldwide audiences? Do you feel do you still feel like the world cares is really the question at the bottom of all this? Of course, it was painful because for us, uh, there is nothing more important than war in our country. And here it seems like everything and everyone should talk about it constantly. But as soon as you leave Ukraine, you see that unfortunately our tragedy is just one of many uh, even though there's uh, this scale of war has not been seen since uh, World War II. Um, people nowadays have such a saturation of news, they, they just cannot focus on so many bad news at once. And of course, they are getting tired, they're getting distracted by their own problems. And I think, unfortunately, it's normal because when... Putin was destroying Syria with Assad. We, I wouldn't say that Ukraine cared much. I mean, uh, we changed when Afghanistan 
was evacuating and we helped the citizens of Afghanistan to leave the country and hosted them in Ukraine. And that was great pride because we finally woke up because we saw that those people, they face even harder challenges than we back then. And our special forces helped. But before in Syria or in Georgia, we didn't pay much attention. We were distracted by our own problems until the war rolled to us. It was our turn. It was all the same people doing it. Um, so now, yeah, we are. We see that the attention span is going somewhere like to Gaza. Uh, and of course, uh, people are also matter. I don't know why, but it's hard for people to focus on so many things at once. Uh, but I would, I would love them to do, to read, uh, to take time because they, unlike us, they still have a chance not to repeat our fate. They have a chance to prepare. And, and if we fall, uh, Putin will go further. I already talked to people from the Baltic countries and they're not sure that NATO is going to protect them uh, in case Putin attacks. So I would say that, yeah, Ukraine war is our problem at first and foremost, but also Ukraine war is, no, is not only about Ukraine, it's about democratic Western world, Western style of being living, being able to fight and being able to um, keep this way of living while autocrats all over the world are uniting and they're much faster and they already showed that they will shake in the old way of living in the world. They will try to undermine it and they're already doing it, not only in Ukraine. That's a very uh, important message, but I wonder if I can ask you one last thing, uh, Veronica, to just describe where you think the fight is at right now in Ukraine. I would say that it's a little bit harder than in 2022 when we didn't have any substantial Western support and we were forced to fight on our own for the first two months. We only had like man pads uh, and laws and javelins that were sent to us um, for partisan warfare, basically. Um, now we are much stronger in terms of weapons, but because we were not getting them fast enough, we were asking for them, begging for them and, and just to hear, no, no, it's impossible, impossible, just to get them six months later or whatever later we lost very many like a lot of our most capable fighters and we don't have enough um, experienced soldiers and leaving ukraine now will be a very big mistake because we we can we still we still can we destroyed like thousands of uh, Russian soldiers, Ukrainian government is like saying like, I still think they kind of unite the casualties and the fallen soldiers in one number, but the number is still huge, 300,000. And Russians never had the war coming to their territory. And we did manage to bring it. And we did manage to reestablish the sea, Black Sea Grain Corridor without the UN and without the Russian authorization. Uh, and we, despite the blockades of our Polish, um, Romanian, uh, Slovak neighbors, we managed to um, show a little slightly growth of economy. Um, and I would say that if the aid stops now, Ukraine does have a very big chance to lose this war because it's impossible to... Uh, run such a big economy and fight at the same time when you don't have a, even a guarantee that your own military production would not be destroyed because Russia can shell all the territory of Ukraine. Uh, 
and I would say that uh, this is a small country, smaller country fighting a superpower, and this superpower is getting boosted by North Korea. It's getting boosted by Iran, and it's not for no reason. It's just the beginning of something bigger. And if Ukraine falls, it's in nobody's interest in, on the, in the West. So whatever corrupt we are or not, unfortunately. I have um, one last question from the audience, and I think we'll leave it there, which is, what do you consider to be the right way to differentiate between the truth tellers and those planted by the other side? What's your advice on people navigating the fraught information world that we live in? I think the uh, phenomenon of truth tellers is so uh, tempting because of their, you know, this partisan partisan floor, you know, nobody else will tell you, but we, we will. Um, I would say that you have to check person's background very very uh it's it must be a very intense check because uh i would never consider my, myself as a truth teller and i know how to handle information i'm not like even the best or close to the best in the field but i do know how to handle the information and i never believe anonymous bloggers, I never believe this uh, uh, telegram channels that we do have like now this boom uh, in Ukraine or uh, Twitter uh, accounts that do not have any background of working in professional journalism or an, like um, for analytics groups or something like this, which are basically the main thing is you have to track this person. You have to check the background. You have to understand that this is not paid lobbies. This is not a bot. This is uh, not a sort of, you know, a person for hire because we do have this kind of people too, which is basically, he was uh, like um, Jackson Hinkle, I guess, uh, or who was that a man in US uh, accused of pedophilia who moved to Russia and became the truth teller there, which is basically, he does not have any um, background other than the military man, but he is presented as this Western token, which mean, uh, which, if he supports us, if he supports Russia, that means the whole West supports Russia. Mm -hmm. It's just that we're not being told about it by the mainstream media. I think it's Trump who made it, unfortunately, because before him, it wasn't like that widespread. Or am I wrong? Hmm. Veronica, we could uh, speak for a lot longer, but we'll leave it there. I just want to thank you for taking our questions, my questions, mm -hmm. Audience's questions. Thank you for what you do, and please stay safe. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and such an interesting conversation. Very much so. And then now back to Alan. Thank you, Nala. Uh, so this brings our event to a close. Uh, before we depart, uh, please let me thank all those who helped make this event happen: uh, the Sturzberg family, our partners at the museum, at CBC Ideas the folks from Carleton University Event Services, and of course, our moderator, Nala Ayad. Uh, but most of all, uh, Veronica, uh, I have to thank you. Uh, thank you for your patience in all of the back and forth. This was actually the 2023 Sturzberg Lecture, uh, which had to be postponed and postponed again. And finally, we just decided uh, to do this online. So thank you for your patience, for all of the time and effort that you have put into giving us a window into the world of, of Ukrainian journalists, of Ukraine, what it means to cover your own society at war. Very few of us uh, experience that. And uh, Michael spoke earlier, uh, citing Martha Gellhorn, essentially signed a, kind of questioning why is it we do this? Why are we telling these stories? Are we are we just writing this on the back of a leaf that flies to the wind? And I just think it's so important for you to understand, and you do, 
the role that you're playing, the importance of what you're doing. If we get distracted and stop paying attention the way we should, uh, please remember that what you are doing is still uh, writing history in the way when we when we listen to the those Sturzberg reports and hear the guns and hear that reporting from a hundred years, uh, decades, decades ago, half a century ago, that still tells us what happened. Despite the constraints he was working under, despite the pressures that he faced as being a member of the team. So thank you uh, for doing what you do and for pulling off a brilliant uh, contribution to the Sturzberg lecture series. And, and finally, uh, thanks to all those who attended virtually. If you want to refer back to anything that you heard today, uh, stay tuned to the School of Journalism website. We will post a recording of this lecture and we will share it with all those who registered for the event in case uh, anyone missed it. As I mentioned, this was actually the 2023 Sturzberg lecture, albeit postponed. We are in the planning stages for the 2024 lecture, which will take place this fall. So please stay tuned for that. So again, Veronica, thank you so much. If you find yourself on your way to Canada, please let me know. We will host you at Carleton uh, in a heartbeat and give our students a chance uh, to meet you and talk about what you do. So with that, uh, please allow me to bring this afternoon to a close and uh, everyone please enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. <laughs>